Let us stand and worship together.
a shout of praise. Come on. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy. together.
tribulations and uncertainty life just has not looked like what we're used to it looking like um, but that song is just a simple yet powerful reminder that no matter what circumstance we might be facing no matter how we may feel that God is still in control and we can trust his plan for our lives amen we're gonna continue in worship by receiving an offering 
we give as an expression of thanks to God for who he is and for everything he's done for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for the opportunity to gather and to worship you freely and to spend time in your presence. We pray that this time has prepared our hearts to receive the message that is to come. Father, we pray for the offering. We ask that you bless it and that you use it to further your kingdom. We love you and we thank you. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. You may be seated. Attention parents, by taking extra steps to make sure it's as safe and as easy as possible, we are thrilled to announce that Ridge Kids will be meeting once again in person starting March 13th and 14th. We will have contactless check-in available and only one parent will be allowed for drop-off and pickup. Kindergarten and up must wear a mask and hand sanitizer stations will be available. We will also be providing family parking spots for easy entrance into the building. Please register your kids beforehand at northridgechurch.com slash kids. And we cannot wait to finally be back together. This past Thursday night, for the first time in over a year, our Northridge family gathered for a worship night to remember. Though the world may change, our God is unchanging, and that is why we praise. I come out of agreement with a lie that you have left me. You wouldn't leave me and you won't You're right by my 
darkness, no evil will tease or torment me. No weapon, no worry will prosper against me. No darkness, no evil will tease or torment me. All power, dominion to one name is given. My fortress, my freedom, my refuge, my Jesus. All power, dominion to one name is given. My fortress, my freedom, my refuge, my Jesus. Protector, you never, never, never let me go. You said you wouldn't leave me and you won't. You're right by my side. Protector, you hide me in the shine. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you here. All of you here in Plymouth, welcome. For all of you who are at our regional campuses, Brighton or Grosseal, welcome. So glad that you're there. And of course, every single one of you, wherever you are around the world online, thanks for gathering together with us at Northridge Church because we're here for one purpose, and that's to lift up the name of Jesus. And we're just so thrilled that you're here. If you're a guest, Welcome to Northridge Church. We're in a series called On God, and it's all about making sure that our view of God is the right view, because it doesn't matter how much you have faith in and how sincere your faith is in God if, if your view of Him is wrong, if you're making Him up, if you're a couple of clicks off. And so this series is all about making sure that we're not worshiping a God of our own making, worshiping a God that culture is defining for us, but instead worshiping the God who created us and who can genuinely set us free and give us a life of fulfillment. And this weekend, we're looking at something that's so easy to forget, and it's the idea that God is genuinely protector where we find our security. And I have to tell you, as, and you know, a lot of times people think pastors are super spiritual people talking to less than super spiritual people, and that is so wrong, at least in my case. There might be some pastors who are super spiritual. I'm just, and I'm sorry, not one of them. If you'd like a super spiritual pastor, churches all around here that probably have some, but, but I'm like, I mean, I'm just so human, and I'm wrapped up in this this physical experience which blocks so much that is real, so much that God is doing, but we just don't moment by moment tend to see it. And I miss it so often, I'm sure you do, but every once in a while, God will, if we're looking, if we truly trust Him, will invade our space and help us to see what we normally don't see. 
And it can be in a very, I mean, non-complex moment. It can be in a very conventional experience. And such was the case in my life and my family's life years ago when our three kids were all born but still very, very young. We were celebrating Christmas together, Roxanne and I and the three kids, and had a great Christmas morning together, and you know how special those moments can be. And then we were getting into our, our car to go up north to spend the rest of Christmas Day and a little bit of Christmas season with my family, my mom and dad and my three brothers and their families. And so celebrating Christmas morning, hop in the car, have all the baked goods and all the presents, and we get on the road up north. But it was one of those days, Christmas days, that you can only experience in the north. It was cold and blistery and snowing and we weren't dreaming of white Christmas. We were experiencing it. Not the perfect weather to be going up north in, and especially when you drive like I drive. I am an absolutely confident driver. I think that's a good way to say it. I mean, all of you are losers on the road, but I've got control, you know? And so I'm on this, this snow-beaten, blizzardy road, going, you know, I mean, why not? 65 miles an hour, passing cars all over the place because I'm going to celebrate Christmas with my family. And then it happens, though I have the delusion of being in control in a car. It's a delusion. It's wrong. I hit, for the very first time in my life, with the most precious treasures of my life in tow, my wife and three kids, I hit black ice. And this minivan, I'm ashamed to admit, yes, I did drive one, minivan went sideways going 65 miles an hour on the highway. Sideways. And I'm not kidding. Sideways. Sliding on that black ice. Cars around us, we're going by cars, and I don't know how it's happening. We're not hitting anybody. We're sliding sideways. And I knew it was going to come. What happens when the black ice stops? And I, the only thing that matters to me on the planet is in this minivan. And because of my delusion of control, I'm now sliding sideways. And I know when we hit concrete, it can only do one thing, flip and roll. That's all it can do. And so I start saying, hold on, everybody, we're going to flip. Hold on, everybody, we're going to flip. Hold on, everybody, we're going to flip. And the kids started laughing at first, and then they weren't laughing. And slowly the car, with all the traffic around, was moving towards the shoulder, which sounds like a good thing, but not, because with all the snow, you hit that shoulder in snow, it's going to flip and roll. And I knew it. And we were on a highway that had a bunch of cliffs around it, like very deep ditches, not safe place to go off. And I just, we were in trouble. It was over. And then we hit the side. And instead of flipping, it spun straight and went hundreds of feet up the ditch and over. And we ended up sitting right in front of a billboard. I don't know. I, it was just... It was magic how with all that was going on, there we were. Not dead, not flipped, not hurt. And as I sat quietly with my family, alive and safe, I knew in that moment, I knew we weren't alone. As out of control as we were, God had supernaturally protected us through that whole event. And, and my heart and voice just softly spoke to him in thanks. I mean, breathing heavy, looking at an advertisement on a billboard, just whispering thanks with the same sentiments of the song we just experienced. I just said, God, you are my protector. You, you never let me go. You said you wouldn't leave me, and you won't. You're right by my side. You hide me in the shadow of your wings. Your presence is my peace, my covering, my song in the night. Protector. It was real for me. 
And whether I feel it or not, it's real for me. Whether you know it or not, it's real. The question is, are you experiencing it? Before we go any further, let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much that we can know you because you've revealed yourself to us, that we can understand you because you've communicated to us, and that we can experience the fullness of life by trusting you. Help us in these moments this weekend to trust you even more. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So in that experience that I had, really lay many of the principles involved in understanding that God is protector. That simple experience. Who doesn't have a car accident, right? Most people have one, a big one, little one. Who doesn't have an experience like that and raw? And yet in that one experience in life, I find and can remember most of the truths about God's protection. Here's the first that I want you to see. The reality is that though we create the illusion of security and control, we have no real security in this world. And there I was in that minivan. I had the illusion of control. I was secure. These other people better drive slow, but I can handle this thing. It was an illusion. I was deluding myself. I was living in a false reality. And when it all came down to it, I had no real security in this world. When you're going sideways at 65 miles an hour down a highway, you can do nothing. Nothing. It was black ice. And I'm going to tell you, it's not just in a car going sideways on black ice. It is in everyday living that we create illusions that help us to feel secure, illusions that help us to feel like we're in control, illusions to help us feel like we can define our lives. But they're illusions. We have no real security in this world. Look at James chapter 4. I mean, God just puts it right on the table for us. Verses 13 and 14. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. I mean, it's an illusion. Why, well, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. Uh, what is your life? You're like a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And I have to tell you, this is true. The fact that we create the illusion but have no real security in this world, this is true in every area of our lives. It's true personally. You know how we create the illusion personally, right? And you can take any area, but I'll take this one. You put locks on your doors. That keeps you safe. We found that locks on the doors wouldn't even keep our teenage kids inside, let alone criminals out. Late in life, I found out my son knew how to pick the lock and come in anytime he wanted. Didn't have to knock. We create the illusions of security in our personal lives. You know, security systems, life locked financially. Come on. It's true professionally. You can do everything right professionally. Everything right. Some of you have, and you can still lose everything. Because you see, though we create the illusion, we're not in control. Not in control of the government, not in control of the economy, not in control of whether a pandemic happens and they lock down and lock us out of our business. It's true nationally. Yeah, we live in the richest, most powerful nation in the world. Doesn't that make you feel just so safe and secure? We're not. We're just as susceptible as any other nation in the world to pandemics, to financial crisis, to terrorist attacks. Come on, they can bring us in a minute to our knees. Any sense of security we get in this world on our own is an illusion. Now that's the, that's the reality we have to start with. And I'm gonna tell you, one of the reasons we get a couple of clicks off on God is because we believe and put faith in the illusion instead of understanding reality. You have to understand reality, but you don't live in the reality. I know some people, some Christians, who are totally imprisoned by anxiety and fear because they understand the reality that there's no real security in our world, but they don't turn to this truth. And the truth is simple. God is our only source for real security. 
God is our only source for real security. There's a place we can go for real, genuine, absolute security, and that's God. But he's the only place, which is why most people on this planet, and even most people who call themselves Christians, find no security. They're either trusting the illusion or not trusting God for his security. They just don't understand it. Look at Proverbs 18.10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The name of the Lord represents him and all he is. He's a strong tower. And the righteous, those that know God, live for God, run into that tower and are safe. It's true. But with the complexity of our human minds locked in this temporary world such as they are, it's so easy for us to go, but wait a minute. I've run into God before, the safe tower, and I still feel very unsafe experiencing all these difficult circumstances. And so here's what you need to know. God really is the great protector. The problem is that so many of us, so many of us don't understand what this does mean and doesn't mean. I mean, we, we really misapply it and interpret it. We don't understand how it works. And this is very evident from how we tend to react to all the negative circumstances and trouble in our lives. We, we tend to react by pulling away from God, getting upset at God, you know, yelling at God, stop pursuing God, and all these different things that we do, perpetually being filled with anger or bitterness or grief. It's all because we're a couple of clicks off on this. We think he's failed us somehow. We think he's not a protector. We think he's forgotten about us, and that's wrong. And I'm telling you, it happens to all of us. It happens to me. So in order to help us have the right view of God as protector, this weekend we're going to look at what God tells us it does mean and doesn't mean. And let's start right here. God doesn't protect us from all trouble. Maybe I shouldn't have done it this way. I should have said God does not protect us from all trouble. Or maybe I should have said God does not protect us because there this is so confusing to so many people. Whenever they experience any trouble whatsoever, regardless what kind, they start thinking, he's failing. His promises aren't true. He's not present. He's not here. Because if I'm putting my faith in him, I shouldn't be experiencing trouble. And that's just wrong. God doesn't protect us from all trouble. He's never said he would. He's never promised it. In fact, he's always promised the opposite. Look at Psalm 46, verse 1. One of my favorite verses. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Doesn't that just, ah, doesn't that just feel like a comforting passage? Have you ever thought about what it's saying? God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help what are the next two words? In trouble. In other words, you're going to experience it. Just know that when you experience trouble, and you're going to experience it, hey, I'm ever-present, I'm right there. Isn't that something? God is present, and yet we're in trouble? What? God is a refuge, yet we experience trouble? God is a shelter, a strength, and yet we experience trouble? Yes. Look at John 16, 33. Jesus really brings this to light. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He doesn't say, take heart. I'm here. I've overcome the world. I walked out of the tomb. No more trouble if you believe in me. It doesn't say that. It says, hey, you're going to experience trouble. In fact, can I tell you, so many people think God's promised us if we have enough faith, we'll never experience trouble. The truth is the opposite. God has promised us, no matter how much faith we have, in this world we will have trouble. That's a promise. In this world, we will have trouble. God doesn't protect us from all trouble. Contrary to what many think and sadly many teach, be careful what you watch on TV, be careful who you listen to, be careful who you read, because there are many, many who teach that God 
Never allows trouble into your life if you have enough faith. It's a lie. No one had more faith than Jesus. Let me ask you a question. I think you'll all get an A on it. Did Jesus experience any trouble? He promises us trouble. And yet at the same time we're experiencing trouble, we can still know, we can still experience his protection because God does protect us from a ton of trouble we never see. Now this is so important. We're so ungrateful because of the trouble we experience. We're so caught up in the trouble we experience that we forget the reality that there's a ton of trouble we never experience because of God's protection. Instead of complaining and whining about the hangnail, maybe we should thank God we don't have a broken hip. You know, that... Okay, that illustration worked for a couple of people. I want you to know, it's not written down. So if it sucked, forgive me. It's like, you know, off the cuff. But you get the idea. I mean, God protects us from a ton of trouble. Look at Job chapter 1, verse 10. The evil one comes to God and says, the reason Job is faithful to you is because you protect him. Look what he says. Have you not put a hedge around him and around his whole household and around everything he has? You're protecting him from all this trouble. You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. And so Satan's accusing God, the reason Job is faithful is because you protect him so much from so much trouble. And so if you know the story of Job, then God says, okay, let's see if that's true. You go ahead and you can create trouble in his life and we'll see if he still worships me or not. Job didn't realize that he was giving glory and praise to God as a result of all this trouble, but it's what he was going through. We don't realize it either. Look at Jesus, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 13. He's teaching us how to pray. This is then how you should pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And I don't know about you, but very often I get to the place where I go, I'm praying, lead me not into temptation, deliver me from the evil one. But it doesn't feel like he's answering that prayer so much. Any of you get there? I mean, if you're at all human like I am, if you're not a robot, an automaton, or some self-deluded crazy person, you, you, you know that you're experiencing some trouble, but you need to know there's a lot more that God is protecting you from. He's answering that prayer all the time. A great example. I heard this a long time ago. I've never forgotten it. There was a missionary, a Scottish missionary years ago, hundreds of years ago, named John Payton and his wife, and they were called to reach a very primitive and violent people. They were called to go reach a tribe that was involved in cannibalism. This is not a safe place. And one night they were surrounded by a group of these people who were coming to kill them, and they only had one option, one option, pray. And it didn't feel very safe. You know, they're coming to eat us, uh, or whatever, sorry. Um, and let's get on our knees and just pray. I don't know about you, but I, I want to do other things. All I could do is pray. Inexplicably, the murderous people left, and sometime later, an amazing thing happened. The chief of that tribe came to faith in Christ. In fact, almost the whole tribe came to faith, ultimately, because of these people. But the chief came to faith, and when asked about that night where they came to kill him, but they left, the chief told them that they left because of all the armed soldiers that were surrounding their house, armed soldiers that didn't exist, except God was protecting them. Why was God protecting them? I don't know. Sometimes people die, sometimes they don't. Why was God protecting them? Because thousands would come to faith because of this guy wasn't time. And though John and his wife didn't see it, God was protecting them. And you might be going, that's unreal. Well, read 2 Kings 6 and see how it happened with Elijah and his servant. The same thing happened biblically, and I believe very clearly it can happen. Doesn't happen often. But you, you need to understand another reality. 
God always tempers the trouble that we experience. Not only is God keeping us from a ton of trouble we never see, the reality is I wouldn't be alive if God wasn't protecting me from trouble that I've never seen, never known about. I need to be grateful for it. But the truth is, much of the trouble I had, which seems overwhelming at the time, I need to understand, you need to understand, God always tempers it, controls it, keeps it tapped down so that it doesn't destroy us or have to destroy us. Instead, it can build us. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you. No test, no trouble has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, to all of us. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. He will always temper the temptation, temper the trouble. And when you are tempted, he will also always provide a way out so that you can endure it. Let's go back to Job for a minute. Job, ultimately, if you don't know the story, lost his kids, lost his wealth, lost his health, had crazy friends left, and a wife that told him to curse God and die. So I'm sure they had a real positive relationship. Everything of value almost was taken from him. He was in a horrible place, and yet as bad as he had it, God was tempering the trouble that he was experiencing, controlling it. And he tells us that. Look at Job chapter 1, verse 12. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Even in the midst of the trouble, what was God doing? Controlling it. Controlling it. I feel overwhelmed by trouble quite often. I'm sure you do as well. But we need to be grateful and remember that as bad as it is, God is still tempering it. It's important. Another very important clarification. God always desires to use our troubles not to destroy us. That's what the evil one tries to do. God always desires to use our troubles to bring about good. He's not allowing trouble in our life to destroy us, to tear us apart, to punish us. He's allowing trouble into our lives for good purposes. Look at Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, in fact, would you say those two words with me? We know that in not some things. Now, I'm telling you, last week I talked about getting a couple clicks off on God and so we don't experience him because we're not seeing him as he is. This is one I get off on. I'm sure you do as well. And we know that, this is how I think, we know that in most things that don't really test me, God is working good. But in those really bad things, like 2020, no. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Great example of this is Paul the Apostle. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. He was thrown in prison. I mean, totally unjustly treated. And everybody's going, man, I'm, it's pretty bad what you're experiencing. Talk about trouble. Look what he says. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, as unjust and as hurtful as it is, has actually served to advance the gospel. He said, look, at, God allowed the trouble for good. Do you realize I'm now able to tell the soldiers and the prison guards of Caesar's household about Jesus? I would have never been able to get access before. He said, we're... We're winning Caesar's household because I'm in prison, because God desires to use even our troubles for good. It doesn't make the trouble not trouble. It doesn't make the trouble less painful. It doesn't mean it's not difficult. It doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. It does. But he's intending it for good. We have to believe in that or we will never experience his fullness. I remember this story there was, because it, I relate so much to it. There was a guy who was shipwrecked, okay? Imagine being shipwrecked. I'm a water guy. I like boats, so I can imagine. That guy was shipwrecked, and he, he asked God to save him. So there he is, shipwrecked. He had collected whatever he could from the shipwreck, you know, the little possessions to try and survive on that shipwrecked, deserted place. And, and he got down on his knees, and I can see it. I can see me doing it. God, save me. Save me. Rescue me. And shortly after he prayed that, he lost everything he had collected. All the remaining possessions and provisions that he'd put together caught a spark from his fire and burnt up. 
And I know how I'd react. So that's what I get to pray for praying. You know, that's what you're going to do for me praying. I, I'd be rich. I'd just be upset about it. But you know what the real result was? <laughs> the smoke from that fire was seen and led to his rescue. There you have it. God desires to use our troubles even, that which is destroying us, it seems, to bring about good. We have to trust him in that. That's the key. I have to trust him no matter what, and so do you. There's another clarification to this truth that's so important. God is always with us in times of trouble. See, for me, it feels the opposite. It feels like God is more with me in the good times than in the bad times. Can you relate to that? I mean, like, man, when things are good, I'm feeling worship, and I'm feeling like, you know, listening to spiritual talk, and I'm feeling like praying, and I'm feeling like, you're good God. But when trouble hits, I'm feeling like pushing away just a little bit. But the truth is, God is always with us in times of trouble. Look at Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, doesn't get much worse than that. I will fear no evil for one reason. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Daniel was a great guy in the Old Testament. There's a book by his name, and he had three friends. And these three friends refused to bow down and worship the false idols of political correctness in their day. They refused. They were instead going to worship the one and only true God. And in their day, who knows if it'll ever happen here, but in their day, worshiping the one true God and not worshiping the false God had a consequence of death. And so they were condemned to the furnace. They heated up the furnace so hot that the people who threw these three guys in the furnace died. The guys that threw them in died. And look at what Daniel 3.25 says. He said, Look, I see four men. How many were thrown in the fire? Three. Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. God's even with us in the fire. But notice this. He's with us, but where are we? In the fire. I'm sorry, I, I don't like this any more than you do. You think, oh, yeah, I've got to go through the fire. I hate this reality, but it's real. We will experience trouble, but know this. God is always with us, even in the trouble. I don't know how far away you feel from him. I don't know how lost you feel from him. I don't know what you've been thinking, but God is with you, whatever trouble you're in. Another truth, God and heaven are eternal. God and heaven are eternal. While all the earthly troubles that we experience and life here on earth are temporary, no matter what we do, life here on earth is temporary. You do know that, right? Some of you nutrition and exercise nuts, you think you're going to beat it. No. You might be here a lot longer than people like me, but you're, you're going too. It's temporary. And isn't this interesting? We throw God away because we don't like the temporary trouble he's allowing us to experience. How dumb is that? When we should never throw God away and what he promises because they're eternal. We've got it all flipped. I know I do. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. Paul experienced tragic trouble, ultimately died as a martyr for his faith. And what's he call his trouble? Light and momentary. Not because it wasn't big trouble, not because it wasn't ultimately going to get him killed. He knew what he was into, but he calls it light and momentary trouble because he knew it was only temporary. And he says it's achieving for us, staying faithful to God, even in this trouble, is achieving for us an eternal glory, he says. And God in heaven being eternal outweighs any trouble he has here, he says. And so, how did he react? I fix my eyes not on what is seen, that's temporary, but what is unseen, for what is seen is temporary, 
What is unseen is eternal. Can I ask you, what are you fixing your eyes on? Paul really, he didn't just speak it, he lived it, because he did die for Christ eventually. Look what he says in Philippians 1, starting with verse 21. For to me, he says, for to me, to live this temporary earthly life is going to be all about Christ, come what may. But for me, because of Christ, to die is actually gain. It's not loss. Jumping to verse 23, I am torn between the two, living in this physical life and going to heaven, which is eternal. He was, he was torn, he says, between the two. I desire my real heart is to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, he says, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. That's just crazy. And you know what? I often go, yeah, that was Paul. Do you do this kind of thing? Yeah, that was Paul. I mean, one of us real humans living, you know, in the later days of history, we can't do that. Wrong. One of my heroes of the faith is a guy named Jim Elliott. I don't know if you've ever heard of Jim Elliott or not, but uh, he died in his 20s, a martyr's death, Jim Elliott. Unbelievably intelligent, unbelievably talented, and an unbelievable Christ follower. And he's one of my heroes in the faith. And I have to tell you, it's kind of odd. It made sense that he was a hero of my faith when I was in my 20s. I'm 62 years old, and I have a hero that was in his young 20s when he died. It's a bizarre thing. And I'm telling you, I, I know about him because I've read his journals, read books about him, just absolutely impacted me. And this guy was deeper when he was 22 than I am at 62. It's unbelievable because of his faith. More than anything else, Jim Elliott wanted to make a difference in the world, but he was killed on a faraway beach by members of the primitive tribe he gave up everything to go reach. Unlike John Payton, who was spared in those moments, Jim Elliott was killed at the beginning moments of his ministry with this primitive tribe. So much for making a difference. So much for the sacrifices. Could have accomplished so much more with his intelligence if he hadn't done this, right? But in the wake of his death, the whole tribe was reached for Christ. And in the wake of his death, a generation, multiple generations of people were forever changed. And I'm one of them. I wouldn't have the faith or the ministry I have today if not for being impacted so much by a guy like Jim Elliott when I was young. God did more than Jim Elliott asked for. And as for dying like Paul, he happily sacrificed the temporary for the eternal. Here's his famous quote. You ready? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And this we know, we can't keep this temporary physical life forever. But we can keep all that God promises us, heaven and eternity. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Too bad that most of us play the fool by keeping what we cannot keep and giving away what we cannot lose. Where are you? Uh, let me give you the application. If we really want to experience the security that only God can give us in this life, then we need to put all of our trust and hope in God. We need to put all of our hope and trust in God, all of it. And I want to show it to you in two ways. We need to put all of our trust and hope in God for this life, for this life, this temporary life. If you're going to experience the best of it, the fullness of it, become all that you've designed, you're designed to be, you have to put your trust and hope in God. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 6, starting with verse 27. Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? No. So don't worry saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things, so seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. 
by the great protector, are you? If we're really going to experience the security we're longing for, then we need to put all of our trust and hope in God for this life and for eternity, for heaven. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us this salvation, this new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade, kept in heaven for you. Jim Elliot put his trust and hope in God for this life, and his life was consequential but lost young, but he put his trust and hope in God for heaven, and that's where his hope never dies. That's where he is right now. Just before we bring this in for a landing, would you bow with me in a word of prayer just for a moment? And as we bow in prayer, I just want to encourage you, if you're already a believer, I bet if you're at all like me anyway, you're a couple clicks off on this one. Won't you spend some time talking to God about declaring your trust and hope in Him for this life, for heaven, and how you're living? Ask Him to get your head right about Him. And while you're praying, if you're here and you've never experienced Jesus, I just really want to encourage you. This is your moment. While they're praying, would you pray with me? Just take my words and make them yours and say, Jesus, I, I need your hope. I need your help. I need your salvation. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, and I'm confessing them to you right now and asking you to forgive me. And I believe you rose again to give me new life. Please, God, give me that new life. I'm asking in faith, in your name, Jesus. Amen. Just before we move on, and just so you know, once I give you my final thought, I have a special kind of emphasis that I want to share with you, so I hope you'll hang with me online and in person, but if you just prayed with me, let us know, would you? We've put together information about next steps you can take to build that relationship with God you just began, and we'd love to send you some stuff. We just need to know. And so it's easy. Just text us to the number 313131 and send us a one-word message, the name of our church, Northridge, and we'll connect with you and, and hopefully help you move forward. But here's the conclusion to the, to the talk. My hope for you, for all of us this week, is for us to know and experience God as our protector. It's my hope for us. For us to be able to experience who He really is in our life. In fact, here's my real prayer for this service. That right now, as we get ready to leave, we will be able to speak the words that were sung just before I got up for my talk. God, you are my protector. You never, never, never let me go. You said you won't leave me, and you won't. You're right, right now, in all this mess I'm in, right by my side. You, you hide me in the shadow of your wings. Your presence is my peace, my covering, my song in the night. Protector. God is our only real source for security in this world. Let's look to Him experience Him, and experience the life that He designed for us. Make sense? Well, just before we say goodbye, um, I, I want to give you kind of an announcement of something that's coming. And I don't know if you realize this. This is why I'm doing this. Easter's coming. I don't even believe this. It's like, I know we've experienced a crazy year, kind of lost track of time, but we're a couple of weeks from Easter. Easter! It's the first weekend of, of April, and you know why God came into this world, right, out of love? Do you know why He died for us and rose again so we could be redeemed out of love? And if there's anything the world needs right now, it's to know God's love and God's hope. It's important, and so we want to, as we move into Easter, try and create a huge tsunami of, of God's love being experienced in our community. 
And that takes us, right? We have to participate if that's going to happen. And so we are sending to every single person in our church family that we have an address for, we are sending this thing that says, show them his love, show them his love, which is a part of our mission, show them his love. Let's, let's show them the point of Easter in the end. And if you, you aren't in our database or you can't wait, if you're in person, you can just go to our guest service thing at all of our campuses and get one of these right now and start this. It's about showing kindness to others, not some special program of Northridge. We're encouraging you to look for ways to show kindness in your everyday life. I mean, it could be easy. It could be saying a kind word to someone. It could be buying a coffee. In fact, I have with me here, and I'm trying to be just very equitable. I have with me two coffee cards. One is for Jesus Coffee Shop, and the other is Tim Hortons. Um, so we've got Starbucks, and we've got Tim Hortons, and I'm just kidding. But it's like, whatever your, your game is, as it relates to coffee, you could buy this, and you know, someone could be standing in line where you go, and you could just go up, hey, have a, have a cup of coffee on me today. And you say, but I don't know them. That makes it special. And then in this card we're sending out, or you can pick up here, we've made, our team has made cards that say interesting things like, hope this makes your day better. So with the coffee card, or if you're giving a tip, if you're going out to eat, isn't it great that restaurants are opening back up in Michigan? You could give a significant tip. Don't do this if you don't give a tip. If you don't give a tip, tell them you're a devil worshiper, not a Christian, okay? It's like, seriously. But if... If you leave a significant tip, a bigger than normal tip, you could leave one of these cards. One of them says, and all you have to do is rip them out, it says, hope this makes your day better. Or another one says, you went through a major historical event, enjoy this today. Or something. And the reason you give them the card is because we wanted to go beyond just an act of kindness and point them to the hope of Jesus. And so on the back of each one of these cards, and you can see these all rip out, they're perforated, and you can give them away. On the back is a website, northridgechurch.com slash kindness. And when they go to that, there'll be a special word to them and information about Easter, ways that we can help and support them if they'd like. Uh, believers or not, and it all starts with you showing an act of kindness and then giving them one of these cards. And I just really want to encourage you, get involved, get involved, get involved. Let's make a swell of God's love as we move into Easter, and that'll make 2021 way different than 2020 right there, and all it takes is our involvement. Just before we say goodbye, I'm going to hand off to our campus pastors, uh, Northridge Grosseal, Northridge Brighton, thanks for being a part. I'm going to hand it off to your campus pastors right now. And while I hand it off to them, I get to talk to you who are here in Plymouth and still online. I just want to thank you for being a part of this place. I want to thank you for your faithfulness. I want to thank you for growing spiritually and growing in your faith with us. And my whole prayer is that Northridge Church will be used by God to make God known in this community and around the world. And that takes all of us together. I'm thrilled that you are here. Hope I'll see you next weekend as we continue this series on God. And until then... I hope you have a great week. Thanks, everybody. <clears throat>